So it'll be a few slides down. So I'm going to tell folk what I'm going to tell them, then I'm going to tell them, then I'm going to tell them what I told them. All right. Amen. Are you comfortable? Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. I have conversations with God when I'm on my motorcycle quite often. Yesterday was one of them. I will develop a message usually by Wednesday, Thursday, and then I will uh, ruminate like a cow, Billy. I'll just barf it back up and chew on it. And so it's hard for me if I get a message too early. Last week I had a message I had to do it too early, and it, it bothered me some. But this week I got to chew on it some. So. And I told God, I said, there are times, Father, that you put me and your preachers and your teachers and your believers between a rock and a hard place. Because when I'm reading the Word, I think what I see going on today, and I have to balance it with uh, the love of God in my heart. One of the things God did for me when I got born again, he put love in my heart. And there was a guy named Keith Green who died at 28 years of age in a plane crash. And Keith had a lot of effect on my life. You can YouTube him all day. I mean, the guy was phenomenal in his music. But he had a song called, You Put This Love in My Heart. And he said, I want to know where the bad feelings go. And that's what I wondered about when I got born again, because I, I had hatred in my heart toward family. I had hatred in my heart toward certain people. You know, as you go through school, if you've ever been bullied, you understand that. You, you get this little hate in your heart and, uh, until you learn to fight back, and then you still got hate. So I, I walked through that. And then I started reading the Word, and I, I know that God put that in my heart. And yet there are times I'll read the word and I say, Lord, if I say what's in what you want me to say, this sounds kind of hurtful. And he said, it won't if you do it with love, if people know that you love them. Matthew chapter 10 is a tough chapter. Uh, in the chapter, Jesus said, I send you forth like sheep among wolves. As you enter into a place, know that there are certain people not going to like you. You're going to be hated because of my name. And then I start realizing, well, why would anybody hate Jesus? And then you realize that the world has been divided over this gospel. It's an absolute truth. Everybody say absolute. See, what we're fighting today is there is no absolute truth. There's no absolute. People are, are struggling. This gener I'll be dead and gone, Fireball, when your generation is going to be dealing with this. But we have a lady that's in, uh, that they want to make into a Supreme Court justice. They ask her, because she defined the word woman. And the dumbest answer I ever heard was, I'm not a, a, a biologist. That's like me walking out and somebody say, is that rain? And I go, no, I'm not a meteorologist. And somebody say, excuse me, is that a cow? And I say, I don't know, I'm not a veterinarian. Are you hearing me? They remove the ability to take away, because we're afraid of, the, the transgender movement, uh, the homosexual movement. And so I said, Lord, I have friends who are homosexuals, and I love them. I have friends who are drunks, and I love them. I have friends that are drug addicts, and I love them. I have friends who are adulterers and fornicators and gluttons and liars. I love them. Such were most of us, and the rest of you were just liars. Can I get an amen? amen? See, what we've done is we've, we've put people in red, yellow, black, and white, and then we throw gay in there. Gay don't belong red, yellow, black, and white. Gay belongs over here in this. I can read you the scriptures. I can tell you, go to Galatians chapter 2, and you can find it there that God's not for that kind of living. But yet we don't condemn them, but we don't condone the lifestyle. So you put this love in my heart to love them. And just because I disagree with you doesn't mean I don't love you. And just because you disagree with me doesn't mean you shouldn't hate me. Can't get an amen. So here's our fight. It's, it's a fight that we struggle with. So Jesus said this in Matthew. Well, that came off a little easier than I thought. I've struggled with just saying all of that for three days. You know, I'm on my motorcycle thinking, Lord, I, just, I got to. Take. And he said, well, I put that love there inside. You teach it with love because that's who you are. You love these people. Matthew 10, verse 40 says, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him, my Father, who sent me. Next verse. 
The one who receives a prophet because or preacher or teacher of the gospel, he as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will also by no means lose his reward. In other words, to anyone who's doing anything for God, if you do something for them, you give them a cup of cold water. Just to do, and you think, well, that doesn't sound like much. No, it doesn't, does it? And he never forgets. And I thought to myself, now that's some quality H2O. Can I get an amen? How many know what a little quality H2O is? Hallelujah. If you've ever seen the water boy, you know what I'm talking about. Come on now. Everything's a devil, mama. Amen. So anyway, when I thought of that, I thought, you know, that's, that's a good title for this. Because what we really need to do is learn and realize that everything that we have done for the last five years, 10 years, 30, 40 years that you've served God, Mr. Hicks, God never forgot any of it. Amen. He never forgot one glass of cold water. Amen. One thing you bless somebody with. If somebody had, had won a thousand to the Lord, you were a part of that. If you blessed a missionary through this church to work over, overseas, amen, you get their reward also. God never forgets. That's love. Father, I love you. Thank you for the word of God. Just give me some anointing, just anything to help me spur this message into the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, amen. amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Everybody say, help the preacher. Amen. He's trying to figure out how to wear these glasses. They look good. I, I wanted to look like Keith today, so I got me some clear ones. <laughs> that just to make him feel good. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Thank you. Really appreciate that, Lord. That's like saying, I I'm going to let the seventh grade football team play against the seniors. Thank you, Jesus. Appreciate it. When I was in, in junior high, if you, you started playing football in the fourth grade, and you played against the eighth graders. Because we didn't have divisions. So if you wanted to play, you just had to decide that you're going to get beat up. And that's what happened to us all through school, man. We just got beat up. Matthew 10, verse 21, as I move through the scripture, it says, A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. And children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. That's heavy. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. Shortly before the Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage, a man by the name of Wallace Henley wrote this, and he called the article, Dear Churches in America, Prepare to be Treated Like First Century Christians in Rome. And he framed it like this. Churches that hold to a strict conservative interpretation of the Word of God about gender and marriage may find themselves Romanized. In our time, this means local churches that do not embrace same-sex marriage or boys thinking they're girls ruining our daughter's sports. Can you imagine all the years the women went out there and protested for equal rights, equal rights, equal rights, finally got to get their own basketball, their own swim team. Sure, you swim, your daughter swim, and then all of a sudden the boy decides he wants to be a girl, and he swims against them and ruins her sport. You know, that may seem okay to you, I, I, I want to ask that boy's daddy how you feel about your son. Your boy ought to be in another. I mean, this bothers me, and I'm not trying to be mean about it, but we, we're saying we feel sorry for him. What about the girls who have worked so hard and trained so hard? What if LeBron decided to put on a wig and play girls' basketball? What if Mike Tyson decided to put on a bra and decided to box against the women? Are you hearing the preacher? So I, I'm thinking through all this stuff, and I'm saying, Lord, we we in a place today I've never seen before. We're like sheep among wolves. We sense it now. Amen. There are five steps by which voices are silenced in the culture. Watch this. First, you get marginalized. In other words, they act like you don't matter. Uh, our voice don't matter. We don't buy toothpaste. We don't, we don't buy the, the things they use, you know. So it doesn't matter if you boycott us. We don't care. We get marginalized. Then the character, characterization, which means to turn you into a cartoon. 
Amen. In other words, to make fun of you. Uh, you're out of touch. You're old-fashioned, Kenny. Amen. Because you're old-fashioned, amen, you're out of touch. You don't matter to us anymore. Say, the third thing is vilification, or to vilify means to make us the bad guy. You know why you're that way? Because you're Christian. Let me tell you, the word Christian should mean to everybody, he put that love in my heart. Amen. We're known not because of the steeples on our churches, not because of our denominations, but we're known because we have love one to another. Can I get an amen? And if you lose that love, then you miss this whole, you, you need to walk away from the argument. Because the issue is, I love people. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Amen. But you have to stand for truth. Amen. A woman is a woman and a man is a man. And this is just one thing that we're dealing with today, but it seems to me the most prominent. I remember when a pastor in California called me about 10 years ago, and he said, get ready. They're fixing to change your bathrooms over there and let men go into the girls' bathroom. I said, it ain't never going to happen in Texas. And then folk from California started showing up in Austin, and the next thing you know, it's happening in Texas. Leave Texas alone. The criminalization, to criminalize. You said, that'll never happen. Did you know right now in Canada that's happening? That if you tell somebody that somebody comes to you and says, Pastor, I'm struggling. Uh, I have a, a, I have a same-sex desire toward another sex, the same sex, and I need help, and you try to help them, and then they turn against you, they can put that pastor in jail now. He's now a criminal. Amen. They can shut his church down over. you got to walk with kid gloves. you got to be careful how you deal with it. You can literally be ambushed about it. And then the elimination to shut you down. So here's the conclusion. We've reached a stage of vilification. Amen. Conservative Christians are now regarded by the consensus establishment as villains. We're the villains. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, in transformed America, America's transformed. The Supreme Court may well take us to a criminal stage. They already, again, have in Canada. The biblical church, therefore, must learn to live as the first century Christians did. Amen. When Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. My problem is simply this. He put this love inside my heart. Amen. And I love people. I want to see the church explode. I want to see people get saved. I want to see them get born again. I want to see them live their best life. Everybody say best life. Amen. Amen. I want to see you live your best. Not not to live below it, but live your best life. Enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your kids. Enjoy your grandkids. Embrace them. Life, man, is moving way too fast. It just keeps on going on and on. And I want to sit back and say, Lord, you put this love inside me. Now help me understand something. He said, well, I'll tell you something, Jerry. If they receive you, they're going to receive me. We read that out of Matthew chapter 10. Amen. And there's a reality there. There's hard times, rejection, betrayal, family division in Matthew 10. There's persecution, imprisonment, beatings, lies, slander, verbal abuse. There's hatred. You know, my, my question is as a believer, why would anyone sign up for this? Before I was a believer, I didn't have to be concerned about this. I didn't have to be concerned about how you lived, how anybody, how I lived. I could just do whatever the blank I wanted. I couldn't even say blank because hell's a biblical thing. Can I get an amen? amen? So why would you want to sign up for stuff like this? In these difficult days, we, we need believers who aren't ashamed of our faith. Amen. I love the faith that God put in my life. I, I love the love that he put in my heart. And compromise will win you no friends, no real friends. When Jesus comes to the end of his message to his disciples after warning them repeatedly of the trouble they can expect, he said, like sheep among wolves to be beaten, betrayed, take, they're, they're going to take your sword. There'll be no peace from this world. And then when he does what any good leader should do, he answers the question, what, what's the reward? Paul the Apostle had that. What's the reward for being beaten, to, for being shipwrecked, for being uh, stoned to death and coming back? What's the reward? I mean, you know, that's a good question. What's the reward for you being so faithful and serving God for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years? Good question. Following Jesus will not win you praise from this world. How many know we're in the world, we're not of the world? We ain't of this place. Amen. If anything, we visiting. Visiting. Amen. They feel like. The visit's about over. Amen. He's coming soon or I'm leaving soon. Amen. Like, but if you dare to take a strong stand on any moral issue because of your faith, you may lose your job. You could lose your friends, quote, unquote. You could get sued. you certainly be attacked by social media. They'll pour it on you. And around the world, our brothers and sisters face the threat of arrest, physical violence, and often death itself. Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Amen. Maybe we'd be better off keeping our head down, our mouth shut, and not making any waves. Uh, why not risk your career? 
Why, why, why risk your life when you could just go along to get along? In Matthew 10, 40, Jesus makes several promises to us. First, he said, I'm going to connect people with God. Your life will connect people. What you love, the love of God in your heart will connect people to God. Verse 40 said, the one who welcomes you welcomes me, and the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. I want you to catch this. First, people welcome you. Second, by welcoming you, they welcome Jesus. Your influence is greater than you realize. You forgot how much influence you have. The other day, I, 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 uh, Joseph, we just left your, your, your mother's memorial, and I sat down for, for a late lunch there, and my phone goes off, and, and I recognize the name that Paul popped up, and it was from literally years ago. And the lady said to me, Pastor, my husband just died, and it's been a while since I've been with you, but you are my pastor. And he told me if I ever, ever, when I die, not if, if I die, when I die, I want, you to, I want you to make sure Pastor Jerry does my funeral. And I said, are you serious? She said, yeah, he loved you, loved the church, even though we weren't there a lot and stuff, but he wanted you. And he loved Jesus, amen. Uh, the day he died, I made sure of it. I love a wife and make sure her husband, she'll see him again. Some wives would omit that prayer. Amen. But she, she wanted to make sure that he was good. And I thought, listen to that. In other words, because of all these years, my influence was still there. Your influence is still there. When you have influence as young, as you get older, you'll realize you're still connected. So people welcome you. They're going to welcome Jesus into their life. And third, by becoming Christ, they welcome the Father. So here's the clearest possible answer to a question that has been raging recently. Do Christians, Muslims, Buddhists worship the same God? Isn't that the question? Our kids are hearing the words inclusion. Amen. we got to include everybody in this. Listen to me. In a world of inclusion, evidently some people want the answer to be yes. We all worship the same God. We have Jesus with God. You have God without Jesus. I'll say that again. You have Jesus with God, but we have God without Jesus. Oh, but Jesus will never allow us to say that. Never. Amen. When you read the word, this verse tells us plainly, the way to the Father is through the Son. Jesus said it. Amen. And again, John 15, 23, whoever hates me hates my daddy. You hate me, you hate my daddy. So in today's multicultural world where we have enshrined tolerance, be tolerant, diversity, pluralism, as a three secular trinity statements like that 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 uh, that don't fit in that we're too narrow minded. You can't say the only way to God is through Jesus. Okay, Jesus did, so I'm going to. Amen. You ain't getting to the. Let me help you. You can worship. God as a Buddhist, you can worship God as a Muslim, you can worship God as a Christian, you can worship God as Hinduist, you can worship God, amen, but it won't get you to heaven. Are you following me? Yeah, it's going to get you to God. How many know everybody's going to God? When you die, you're going to God. You can be an atheist, you're going to get to God. As a matter of fact, if I understand my scripture right, you're probably going to get to heaven. You just won't get to stay. Ooh, pastor, that's mean. Mm. I had a T-shirt somebody gave me that said, live in such a way the pastor won't have to lie at your funeral. <laughs> Do you know I have to repent <laughs> for lying at some of y'all's family's funerals? I was just hoping what I said was the truth. Amen, at least close to it. Can I get an Amen. Amen. We're just going to talk truth here. So when we preach the gospel, we're connecting people with God. We're preaching the one and only message that leads from earth to heaven. Younger, old, richer, poor, male or female, we all have the privilege of connecting people with God by sharing the gospel of Christ. And by the way, if you don't like this preaching and if you're watching and you don't like it, there's plenty of preachers that's going to tell you the other way. Amen. They're going to give in to it. But I only have a few more years left on this earth, and I don't want to compromise and give in to the fact that truth is truth. Amen. He put his love in my heart. I love people. Amen. And I've loved them through it. And by the way, they've loved me through it. They've loved me in my sin and in my mess and all the stuff I've gone through in life. They've loved me through it. 
Amen. That's what love do. Second, we will become a source of blessing to others. Verse 41. Anyone who welcomes a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he's righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. Amen. It's a passage on honor. We can't all be prophets and preachers and teachers and missionaries. and Amen. But, but we all can be more welcoming at any moment, any moment in history. Some people come to the forefront. Presidents, kings, generals, potentates, famous people of all varieties. We've seen it overseas. You didn't even know who the leader of Ukraine was until the last month ago. Amen. It is to say, you didn't know there was a 16 year old boy that drove a red Silverado truck either until a tornado came through. Who was coming back from Whataburger after getting a, I think he was uh, yeah, getting a job interview. He got a job and a truck. I drive through a tornado for that. Come on, Jesus. Amen. As a matter of fact, I don't know about you. For some of you, you saw that video, it scared you. It didn't me. I envied the kid. Amen. I'd have loved to have that chance. It looked like that movie Twister. Amen. Somebody said, well, Pastor, what do you think about that Chevrolet flipping over like that and driving through it? And I said, if it a Dodge, it'd never flip. Quit, 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 quit. Quit. Jesus alluded to this when he talked about some who have one talent. And see, that's the thing. Not everybody, we're on the same level when it comes to grace, but we're not on the same level when it comes to talent. And the scripture lays that out. Life is not fair. Mm -mm. It ain't fair. Amen. Uh, uh, I was with my friend Rob Cobb yesterday, and of course Jessica was there in Fireball, her little daughter, Andy. And Andy was kicking her feet up and doing a little dance move. And I thought, if I could kick my leg that high, I'd be in the hospital. If I could even do anything like that, I would be in traction. Amen. It ain't fair. Amen. After I had surgery when I was uh, 14 years old, I've never been able to run since. It is not fair. Life ain't fair. It's never going to be fair. Fair is the place where they give ribbons to pigs. That's a fair. Monkey poop and Ferris wheels. That's fair. And life's not fair. Amen. So the scripture lays out, and Jesus said in Matthew 25, 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability, and he went on his journey. I love the scripture that just lays out the truth. You know, some folk, are, they were five bags, and some folk were two bags, and some folk just a bag. Amen. It's just what it is. He says, while we, we like to say the ground is level at the foot of the cross, and it is, thank God for grace, some folk have more opportunities than others. Amen. Some folk are born into opportunity. Some folk got to make their own opportunity. And when I read through history, there's only one Billy Graham, there's only one D.L. Moody, only one Charles Spurgeon, only one Martin Luther. Amen. And so it goes. Jesus promises, amen, to level the playing field in a different way than we expect. He said this, if you serve if you bless, if you welcome, amen, a prophet, if you're good to the righteous, you get the same reward. That's how he leveled it. Amen. I, re I read it to you again. Anyone who welcomes, all I got to do is welcome. Amen. I welcome you. We got a pastor going to be here next week for our conference, Pastor John Ramsey. Every time when you welcome him, you just accepted the same reward he's going to get in life. That's what Jesus said. He said, let me level it this way for you. So we see the prophets, amen, the ones who share the word of God. We rarely see those who support them. We see great leaders. We rarely see those who stand in the shadows. But somebody has prepared the breakfast. Somebody got to care for the children. Somebody got to open the door. Somebody got to park the car. Somebody, And all those people are part of the same reward that the one that's up front's getting. Can I get an amen? You got to remind yourself of that. You got to, I, I ran sound for four years in a major church in San Antonio, and I realized me running that sound got the same reward as the pastor up there preaching the Word of God, amen, according to the Bible that I'm reading. Can I get amen? And those who stand and wait in the shadows receive the same reward as the man or the woman who receives all the public acclaim. A pastor, they want thousands to Jesus. Yeah, but they didn't do it alone. Amen. Well, he built a great church. Yeah, but he didn't do it alone. Amen. That's why when people say, Pastor, you, you got a great church. I didn't do it alone. Amen. I can't do this alone. Amen. This took a whole group of people. A past, she filled stadiums with thousands who came to hear her sing. Yeah, but she didn't do it alone. Yeah. Well, they started 150 churches in Thailand, but he didn't do it alone. Amen. Somebody had to help him out. Nothing great is ever done alone. 
Amen. You've got to have somebody working with you. Those who wait, those who serve, those who answer the email, those who put out drinks in the cafeteria. Amen. Those who mow the grass, those who keep the computers running, those who serve on the food line, those who prepare the meals, those who park the cars, open the doors, those who open their homes for the hurting, those who fold up the chairs after a muscle car Sunday. Thank God many hands make light work. Hallelujah. Get the same reward as everybody else. I'm not saying it. He said it. Amen. And he doesn't forget it. You forgot it. You forgot all the things you've done for God. You've, you've forgotten all the blessings. He never forgot any of it. Amen. He never forgot one thing. Amen. And again, we can't all be prophets, but we can all win the prophet's reward. Last point. That's some quality H2O. We will be remembered for the tiniest acts of kindness. Wow. Sometimes we think we got to go do something great. But I remind myself over and over, what I'm doing here is going to matter there. Amen. And if I can be kind to people here, it's going to make a big difference. So whoever gives just a cup of cold water to one of those little ones because he is a disciple, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. A, a cup of cold water don't mean nothing to you. Oh, you go to your refrigerator. Most of y'all got the refrigerator, got that, got that water squirts out of it. And you hit another button, it, it chunk ice in your cup for you. Imagine 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day what a cup of cold water was like. Amen. It had to come out of a stream uphill somewhere. It had to be a, a, a walk to get to it. You didn't have ice kicking out of, a, out of a refrigerator then. It didn't have. So to get a cup of cold water. Amen. I remember the power of cold water after hauling hay at, at 15 years of age all day long, slinging hay bales uh, in, in Waterloo, Alabama. Hallelujah. I'm sweating. I'm, 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 and a matter of fact, my cousin threw a six-pack over in the creek so it'd be cold when we got done working and, and working, sweating. Can I be honest with you? That six-pack in that creek never turned cold. It was the nastiest tasting Budweiser I ever tried. Just spit it right back out. I'd trade it all day long for a cup of cold water. Football practice, bad practice. The only good thing about practice was the reward of a cold cup of water. Some quality H2O. And he said, if I give that to the least of the disciples, I also get the reward. When I read that, I thought, God, you, you're so good. You told the disciples all the things they got to endure. And then at the very end, you said, don't forget to give people a cold cup of water. Amen. Be a blessing to them. Hallelujah. Look at it first. Whoever, whoever. There are no limits to this promise. You don't need to be a pastor, a missionary, a professor. You don't need to be ordained. Amen. You certainly don't need a seminary degree to qualify. You, do, all you need is a cup of water. So. I said, all I got to find, just give me a couple. Uh, that qualifies you. Now you qualify. Amen. Second thing, look at the recipient, one of the little ones. In the context, Jesus is talking about the least among his followers, the little ones, the, the young ones, the young believers everywhere. If you reach out to the hurting, to the forgotten, to the marginalized, to the poor, the homeless, the abused, women trapped in abusive situations, to a prisoner, to a widow, to an orphan, Jesus sees your concern for the people of this world. Amen. Others may not see it, but he saw you. He saw you bless them. He saw you do something for them. Third, look at the action. To give means to reach out a cup of cold water. It's simple. It's inexpensive, often unseen, requires very little preparation. Amen. One guy once said, a cup of cold water may contain a sea of warm love just to be able to give some water. Fourth, look at the certainty of the reward, I assure you. For most of us, a cup of cold water, no big deal. We're thirsty, we just go to the faucet and we get us a drink. Uh, I have a daughter, Katie. I've never seen a girl drink glass of water as fast as she does. I mean, I, I literally said every time she comes over, she shoves that glass underneath there and <laughs> fills it up. And I just sit and watch her. I, I dream of drinking water that fast. I mean, it just, it just goes. And I'm thinking, she could win a ribbon. And it's just take back in there and do it again and again. And I'm thinking, and they get on to me all the time. My, my family stays on me all the time. You don't drink enough water. Has anybody ever heard anybody say that to you? You don't drink enough water. You need to drink. How much, Joseph? 64 ounces a day? Huh? More? If I drink this a day, 
I reward myself. If I just get one of these down a day. And I, I finally looked at my wife one day as she nailed me over. You got to drink more water. I said, that ain't in the Bible. <laughs> Don't tell me that Jesus and the disciples walked around with a 64-ounce water jug everywhere they went. Amen. They measured out their water, how much water they going to need. Amen. Where y'all come up with all this stuff? If I drink all that water, I'm spending all my time in the John. <laughs> or do we call it Jane today? I don't know which one we call it. We some, <laughs> kind of messed up here. God, I got to quit. Many parts of the world, water's a rare treat. We've raised money to build wells in Africa where water was a treat, where it could be in a village and not down in a river. We forget just how blessed we are. Amen. How wonderful things are. Matthew 25, verse 34. Jesus said, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let me tell you something, but God does it. I told you to begin the message. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then tell you and tell you what I told you. Well, that's what God does. God's going to tell us what he's going to tell us. That before the world's ever created, I created a place for you. As a matter of fact, I, my son was slain from the beginning. From the very beginning. Before I created the world. I saw the sin problem. I, I know the serpent. I know of all this. My son was slain from the foundation of the world. And then we watched the progression of the seed go all the way up to our Easter season, and then Jesus dying for us, and then we look back and see what he did for us. So I'm going to read the scripture, come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Listen, Jesus is water to the thirsty. He said, you drink from me, you never thirst again. He's bread to the hungry. He's a friend to the stranger. He's a covering to the naked. He's a healing to the sick. And he's not ashamed of my chains. Then they said, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see when did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? What a question. Surely if you fed Jesus, you'd remember it. If you gave him clothes, You'd remember it. If you visited Jesus in prison, you'd remember it. But they didn't. So Jesus explained in verse 40, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Boy, does that just slap you? So there are times I'm with people and I realize this is a brother, this is a sister. And if I do something for them, and I, I, let me be honest, last week, Two weeks ago, I told you there's a difference in toxic and taxing. Toxic people are dangerous people. They're allergic to love. Taxing people are difficult people. They, they need love. And God will put taxing people in your life. Some of you call them relatives. Amen. They're difficult. But Jesus said, if you do it for the least of these... You did it to me. Some of us, we proclaim our love for God, but our actions show that we don't love him like we say we do. Amen. But to reach to the leaderless and to give them a cup of quality H2O, to give them some water, changes everything. Listen, he's on the receiving end of the mercy transaction. He sees the single mother struggling with the three kids. Uh, he, he, was, 
He has a cell inside of every prison in the world. He walks the halls of cancer unit at the hospital. He sees. He hears the cries of the abused children. He knows when a loved one has left your life and how much it's affected your heart. Amen. If you look, you can see him in the debris fields and streets and foreign lands and, and the hurting among those in New Orleans. Amen. You can see him in the Fifth Ward in Houston. And Jesus is walking among people. And he asks us if they... If they know you, then they'll know me. And the only way to the Father is through me. And if you're kind toward them and you give them a cup of cold water, I'm going to give you a reward for that. Wow. You know, today we're so big into superstars, aren't we? we it's not going to matter when you get to heaven how many home runs you hit, how many baskets you made, all the great accolades you got when you were young. What's going to matter? is did you give somebody a cup of cold water? Did you bless somebody in the midst of their troubles? We're called to be faithful in doing whatever God gives us to do. If God tells me, listen, I just need you to give somebody a cup of cold water, I'm going to do that. If he says, I need you to crawl on top of a roof and fix a leak, I'm going to call David. <laughs> amen. you got to learn to use the resources around you. Can I get an Amen. One day, long after we've forgotten the frustrations of this life, he will remember it. You're, you're a tremendous group of people. You've listened to me preach for many, many years. And I can tell you that it doesn't get any easier because the world's making it harder. But I believe we can still reach people in the name of Jesus. Amen. That we can love people. And if I can reach out with a cup of water, if you throw back my face, you can't make me hate you. You can't make me hate you. Now, you might make me slap you, but you can't make me hate you. I can slap you in love. Can I get an amen? I've whooped my kids and still loved them. Can I get an amen? I've whooped the tar out of them and still loved them, loved them, loved them. So I can hit you and still love you. You love that kind of preaching, don't you? I can tell. I know y'all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. You never ask us to sacrifice for no reason. Every sacrifice we make has a reward attached to it. When the going gets tough, oh, open our eyes to see eternity. Help us understand as we go forth as sheep among the wolves, that the wolves can never destroy the lions. I thank you, God, for the spirit that's in this house, to reach, to touch, to connect. Help us have a spirit of discernment as we come to this. And help us speak absolute truth. Lord, if it's a duck, it's a duck. If it's a woman, it's a woman. If it's a man, it's a man. Set our young ladies free. Let them rise up with a truthful voice and a heart of love. We're not, we're not against you. We just ain't for you racing with us. We love you in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Come on, give God praise in here. What you do?